All right, and we're going. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 85 of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Gavin. That is Fia. Mike is adventuring, and uh, we actually listened to what Mike sent us this week, and I'm sure glad we did. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this a, a very, very minor, I think, content warning. Uh, Mike has a fun history fact. Yeah. Uh, this was supposed to be a Mike Takes the Wheel episode. You know, episodes that end in five are typically Mike's. Um, but in lieu of that, Mike gave us a, a fun history fact um, about a particular piece of anatomy on a president. Um, if you are somebody who is sensitive to that kind of thing, uh, fast forward roughly a minute and a half, two minutes, uh, and we'll be good to go. So anyway, here's Mike. Hey, everybody. Mike, you were just another quick update. Um, and I know this week was supposed to be a Mike Takes the Wheel episode, and unfortunately I did not have a full episode planned for you guys. But a quick history fun fact, the first president of the United States known to be circumcised was John F. Kennedy. Now you know. As far as what I did this week, on uh, Monday I went and hiked, or pardon me, let me go back actually a day before that. On Sunday I showed up to the upper uh, upper head trail works um i'm not exactly sure what the name of the parking lot is but it doesn't matter i camped i camped in about six miles um set up camp for the night so that i could wake up on monday and monday i was able to do three peaks i did marshall cliff and redfield none of the three had uh, particularly good views and so i had much better hopes for tuesday so i camped out again and i went tuesday i went to do Gray, Skylight, and Marcy, Marcy being the tallest peak in New York State. The problem was that it was raining and cloudy and windy, and there was no views on any of those peaks. So I was able to get six done, none of which I particularly enjoyed this weekend. But this weekend, the first couple days of this week is what I should say. Uh, But still six done. I have 27 done thus far. And whatever 46 minus 27 is left to go. That's my update. Now back to Gavin and Fia. So thank you for that wonderful fact, Mike. And uh, yeah. also, I'm sorry that, you know, th- those peaks were not as uh, as nice as you would have preferred them to be. But um, hopefully weather will be better going forward this week. Although I don't think it will be. Uh, it's supposed to be really hot and gross here in the Northeast in the next couple of days. So the views might be better, but hiking will not be better. Yeah, it comes at a cost. Oh, yeah. How's life down in the swamp? Oh, it's good. It's cooled down a little bit because it's been raining here, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, but pretty good. Nice. How's uh, How's all that data analysis going? It's going great. Yeah. Uh, I am over halfway done with my samples, which is way more than I thought that we would be able to get done by now. But it's seeming like I'll be done by like early next week before I get to uh, come back to the Northeast. (laughs) That is awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's always a big relief when all of your actual analysis is done, because there's so many memes and I'm in, even though I'm no longer in grad school, I'm in several like grad school oriented Facebook groups for memes. Yep. And many of them revolve around, okay, you can't just continue to do experiments. You have to actually interpret the data. Yeah. And that's always generally people's least favorite part. But I guess you, you said earlier before we started that you've actually been enjoying it. Yes. Yeah. It's been going good. So good. Good. It's always nice when research comes together yeah and how's your job going Kevin it's going really well uh we just got a new faculty member um you know she was technically hired before I was because you know hiring especially you know PhD faculty um is a really long process so I think she officially got hired sometime um well before I got even came out for an on-campus interview back in March um but her first official day was this past uh, Monday. And so, uh, you know, I got to meet her and sort of commiserate moving from one, one place to another. She moved from Wyoming that was, she was doing a postdoc position at university of Wyoming. And now she is, uh, uh, here with us in, in Pennsylvania. So, um, 
Yep. And so it was uh, really cool. I'm actually going out with her and the uh, the faculty member that she is replacing on uh, tomorrow, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, um, to some field sites that the the previous faculty member uh, used, you know, used to take students to and stuff uh, for, you know, for classes and lessons and stuff. Um, just so she can get, you know, know where they are and know what kind of things he uses each site to show because each site is unique and you can use different sites to teach different things. Um, and it'll be nice for me to go because I haven't been to too many of them. And also I'm the one who gets stuff ready for them when they go out in the field. So it'll be nice for me to uh, yeah. get out there and see it to actually know what they'll need, not just have them give me a list. It'll, it's nice to actually understand why they need the things they need. Yeah. Field work is fun. So. I'm exactly. hoping it's a good That's time. It. Yeah. So today. What do we have? Um, we we missed Shark Week by a week. Yeah. I believe Shark Week. We looked it up last week. Uh, Shark Week was last week. Yeah. Um, and last year, if you remember way back to episode 31, we had an episode and a bonus episode, ep- episode 31.5, uh, about sharks and Shark Week. And... While I'm sure that there has been some interesting new research about sharks in the year since, uh, probably not enough to warrant an entire new episode. So we're going to be talking about the close cousins of sharks, which are the rays and skates, which are a much, much less um, charismatic group than sharks. Aww. As much as I like them, especially after doing the the research for this episode, I really like them. They're really interesting for a a lot of different ways. Um, But they're sort of Shark's little brother. You know, most people know what like a stingray is. Everybody knows what a shark is. And pretty much nobody knows what a skate is. I do not know what a skate is, I will say. Well, you're going to learn. So... Let's let's talk about what exactly kind of animals we're talking about here. So, we're talking about uh, a group of chondrichthians. So, what 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 does that mean? Mm. Chondrichthians um. are vertebrates, meaning that they have they're things with bones in them. They're nathostomes, which means that they have jaws. So even things like lampreys and hagfish are technically vertebrates they technically have the structures that define a vertebrate but they don't have a true jaw they have muscles around their mouth and they have uh, especially like things like hagfish or lamp well actually no mostly lampreys have this but they have what look like teeth but are actually made out of keratin not actual bone and dentin and enamel like your teeth are made out of so they have a mouth but not a true jaw but chondrichthians do and then uh, chondrichthians are one of the major group of fish. You have your bony fish, which is pretty much every fish you're thinking of. And then you have your cartilaginous fish, which are the chondrichthians. Cool. Yeah, usually things that say chondro is something to do with uh, uh, cartilage. Typically, you know, if I don't know offhand any like cartilage based diseases. Isn't there osteochondriasis or something? I haven't heard of it, but that sounds real. Osteo, no, osteochondriasis. I think it's so something that sounds, <laughs> if I just had to guess, that sounds like cartilage turning into bone. Yeah. I don't know what it is, but that I know. Osteo that usually means bone. Chondro yeah. meaning cartilage. Yeah. Was I right? Uh... We can make an edit here if you want to. (laughs) It says it affects the growing skeleton. Osteochondritis is a group of disorders that affects the growing skeleton. Results in abnormal growth, injury, or overuse of the developing growth plates surrounding ossification centers. Okay. So that that makes sense, I guess. You know, it's bones kind of form from cartilage, especially when you're growing. That's why baby bones are kind of squishy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that makes sense, I guess. But uh, chondrichthians, notably, except for their jaws, pretty much all the rest of their skeleton is made out of cartilage. Um, that's hypothesized to have been for a number of reasons. It's sort of been thrown around that 
that was how fishes started, which kind of makes sense. That's kind of how like hagfish and lampreys and those jawless fishes are. But I've also heard it hypothesized that no sharks used to have bones, but they did. They got rid of them for some reason. Hmm. I I don't know one way or the other. Um, so that will be maybe a future update. Uh, but I didn't really find too much super supporting either way. Gotcha. But within the Chondrichthians, there are a couple main groups. So the first group that branched off is called the Holocephaly. Those are the, uh, they're called chimeras or sometimes ratfish. They are very deep sea, really big eyed, and they have um, these sort of front teeth that look like a rat, which is kind of why they, they get their name. Um, used to be very, very prominent group um, way back even before the dinosaurs, you know, th- those groups split off of the rest of, you know, sharks and rays and things like 400 million years ago. So really old group. Yep. Um, but the group that contains sharks and rays is called the elasmobranchs. Ooh, fun um, word. Yeah. Oh, it's a fun one. So brank usually means something to do with lungs or gills. Um, so they have fairly complex gills. Um, and so, like I said, those split off 400 million years ago or so. And then the group within that, so we have the shark group, which is called the selachimorphs, and the ray group, which are called the batoids, the batoidia, which I first thought they called them that because they look like bats. You know, they flap their wings, they move around like that. Ha ha, funny joke. Um, uh-huh. No, that's actually not true. Um, huh. I definitely thought that going into this. Um, but I think it's based off of the same root as like um, the very deep parts of the ocean are sometimes called the baffle regions. Oh. So same same root there. For whatever reason, they just cut off the H. For, for this <laughs> root, I'm not sure. Latin or, and or Greek are weird. Uh, so. Yeah. Uh, but the, the sharks... And the rays split off sometime in the late Triassic, early Jurassic, so somewhere in the ballpark of 200 million years ago or so. So much more recently than uh, the chimeras. They're doing their own thing. But they, that this group, this flat pancakey boys, split off from sharks quite a while ago. And so most people... Even, you know, myself included going into this episode, so don't at all feel bad if you also think this, thought that there were two types of rays, stingrays and manta rays. They look pretty different. They're both flat. So, but those are actually fairly closely related, and there are several other different kinds of rays. Whoa. Yeah. So manta rays and stingrays are sort of, have a relationship sort of like birds and dinosaurs where birds are a specific subgroup of dinosaurs that did something weird. Same Can thing I guess, with... Yeah, go ahead. I think that manta rays are a subgroup of stingrays. Absolutely. Wow. So stingrays evolved to be bottom dwellers, and that's why they're so flat and pancakey. And then a subgroup of them decided that they wanted, you know, well... You know, evolution doesn't want, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> that they should get up into the water again and be much more free swimming up in the water column, not resting on the bottom. Um, and that's why manta rays, things like uh, eagle rays, are also in that same group. Um, that's why they have are much less circular and pancakey and much more uh, broad and flat. So... This, this group, the Batoidia, is made up of four orders. And we've, we've gone through many times on this podcast that different levels of taxonomy only mean so much, but you will often see them called order this or order that. Um, so we, we have an entire episode about uh, how taxonomy is kind of arbitrary, episode 58. So if you want a much more in-depth explanation as to what this means, because I'm going to mention it again in a little bit, uh, reference back to episode 58. Cool. So the 
number of species of rays is kind of up in the air depending on what group you look at because some are kind of bounced around from group to group to group so all of the numbers that i might give for any of these particular groups are kind of an appro approximate just based on what i could find um from fairly recent sources but uh all of it subject subject to change as most of taxonomy is so the first group we're going to talk about is the group that you're probably all thinking of when i say rays uh, and this would be the order Myliobatiformes. Like I said, these are most of your rays you're thinking of. There's a lot of really fun names in this episode as well. <laughs> um, for the sake of everybody, including myself, I will not be just spouting out all the scientific names because that's not really helpful to anybody. Um, yeah. But so within this order, there are 10 families, around 29 genera, and... Uh, around, again, depending on how you count it, 220 species. Wow. For, for reference, there are, give or take, 500 total species of sharks. So this order is, like I said, your what you are thinking of as a ray. This includes your stingrays and your manta rays. But it also includes things like uh, the six-gill stingray, which is unique. Most rays have less gills than that there's also a six gill shark which is strange for evolutionary reasons that we can talk about in a future episode about jaws um <laughs> there's uh the deep water stingray and the round stingrays are in one particular group the american round stingray is in its own particular group whiptail stingrays river stingrays butterfly stingrays and eagle rays are all in a related group uh, eagle stingrays also including manta rays. So eagle rays versus stingrays, like I said, all of those are sort of in, in the same order. They're all fairly closely related, more closely related to each other than they are to other groups of flat shark-like things. Um, the only real difference between things like manta rays and the more flat stingrays that you're probably thinking of is like I said, uh, manta rays are much more adapted for being up in the water column. Uh, they have a much thinner tail. They mo I think there's one species of eagle ray that still has a sting on its tail, but mm -hmm. all the rest of them don't. Um, oh, really? And a lot of them tend to be uh, bigger because you just need more you know, power to be pushing your way through the water column uh, as opposed to just sort of hanging out, chilling on the bottom. So they don't have stingers, but do they have barbs? Generally, no. Hmm. Their their tail seems to be just kind of thin and whip-like almost. They don't tend to really have much in the way of, like, defensive capabilities, which I think also is potentially why things like the giant manta uh, get so big. Yeah. Uh, for reference, giant mantas can be 20-plus feet across. Wow. They're very big. Um, yeah. What order did you say this was again? So this is the order Myliobatiformes. Cool, cool. Um, I actually like I just said, uh, yeah. I actually just looked uh, up a species that is in Louisiana that uh, when I was fishing I actually caught one. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So it was uh, the Atlantic stingray, which is in that order. Yes. Um, I had caught it and it had, um, its tail was clipped, so it didn't have tail. Oh. Yeah. Um, I put it back. <laughs> Just. Nice. <laughs> but I did, I did hold it because I was like, well, it doesn't have any sting, so. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you know what it was at the time when you caught it? Because as we'll talk about in a little bit, there are some stingrays or other types of rays that are very dangerous. So I knew that it was an Atlantic stingray and okay. I thought that they did have barbs um, but because it was clipped I didn't really think anything of it um, and yes a lot of these do have barbs or, or stings or, or uh, whatever you want to call them and uh, that are I guess venomous because it injects you um, but uh Specifically, things like the the eagle rays and mantas don't have those gotcha. stings anymore. Yeah. Okay. Sorry if that cool. sorry if that wasn't uh, clear <laughs> before. Um, cool. Cool. 
Cool. But yeah, most of these that are the true stingrays in this order do have some variety of barb on their tail. Okay, that makes more sense. So, like I said, that all of those, all those 220 species, if you are thinking of a stingray, it is in this group. However, there are three other orders that are all on this side of the broad shark family tree. I'll circle back to this in a little bit, but the most closely related to them, the, the most flat pancakey guys, is the order Rajiformes, which are the skates. I consistently saw that as being the most closely related, but as we'll circle back to, maybe not, because genetics is weird. Skates, if you are not familiar, look like a less stingray-y stingray. They are not quite as... They're still very flat, but they're not quite as flat. They You can tell that it's shark adjacent. They have a much uh, more robust tail. Uh, they tend to have a dorsal fin, while, whereas rays don't. Uh, their pelvic oh. fins, which are the main fins that make up, uh, it's called the disc, which is, you know, the main circular part of their body, uh, is two lobed. There's a smaller lobe in the front and then the broader lobe uh, as you get more toward the tail. Whereas in stingrays, it is all a single lobe. Mm. And uh, stingrays and other rays give live birth, whereas skates lay eggs, which are, you might have heard, called mermaid purses, the little... Oh. Um, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have heard of that. <laughs> yeah, they're sort of like an uh, oblong sort of rectangle that comes to a point on, on the points. It usually has some kind of almost like a whisker or something that comes off each of the corners. Yeah. Um, they're really cool. They're very common to find uh, washed up on beaches and stuff. Yeah, I think my secret wish uh, is to just come across a mermaid purse once <laughs> on the beach. But at the same time, I hope I don't because I want it to be in the ocean and like develop. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe that there are some types of sharks that lay similar eggs, but the ones that are traditionally called mermaid purses are uh, from skates. Cool. And so just for reference, we said there were 500 species of sharks, roughly 220 species of rays. Skates are, have, have de again, depending on how you count them, 270 species, so there's even more skates than there mm. are rays, which really surprised me because skates are just much less well-known to people. Yeah. So there are four families in this group. There are the smooth skates, the soft nose skates, the pygmy skates, and the true skates. They all vary from, you know, group to group, but um, they all generally, like I said, look like a less pancakey stingray. Very cool. Next up, we have a group that I knew was like related to sharks somehow, but I didn't know that they were on this side, uh, which is the rhino pristiformes, which are the shovel nose rays, but you'll much more uh, hear them called uh, because this is much more fun. The guitar fishes. <laughs> and even better, the banjo rays. Ah, I like that. Mm hmm <laughs> And so, once again, these look like a more shark-like stingray. They still have, again, like I said, it's called the disc, which is the, the flattened pectoral fins. But unlike stingrays, they actually have a very shark-like rest of the body behind the pectoral fins and the head. Hmm. Um, depending on what sources you look at the amount of species in this group can kind of vary um from what i consistently found there were somewhere between five and seven families um a good you know decent number of species not anywhere near the 200s but a few dozen different species now i'm looking at some pictures of these and mm -hmm. do these have any barbs or stingers because i'm not seeing them no Oh, that is cool. mostly just a true stingray thing in that order. Okay. My, my Leo batiforms. Got it. Cool. The, the skates can sometimes have like thorny or very rough 
um, back on them, uh, some or, or some like the smooth skates don't have any rough scales on them at all, like you would think of like a shark. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, most skates do have uh, some kind of rough, thorny uh, back to them. But these guys tend not to. These are much more mobile than a lot of uh, a lot of true rays are. But they have a much more, like I said, sharky body. Um, some other features of this group is that they all are generally really slow growing and slow reproducing. And because of that, and because of the general state of the planet right now, many of these are really <laughs> susceptible to going extinct. Oh, no. Um, yeah, so some of the members of this group, like I said, are the guitar fishes, the giant guitar fishes, uh, the banjo rays, wedge fishes, and also saw fishes are in this group too. Hmm. Yeah, so the sort of sharks with the long snout with the quote-unquote teeth poking out to the side, uh, yeah. those are in this group. Wow. Um, and like I said, around the head, they are very squat and broad, but posterior to that, they are very shark-like. They have all the prominent fins that a shark should have, the dorsal fin, you know, their, their tails are very much like a shark, um, but their front is just very flat. Cool. This this group also potentially includes pan rays, which I also think is a very fun name because it's just like, oh, it's a frying pan. Um, uh, that ties into my swamp corner. Just if you're listening, oh, I don't mind. <laughs> okay, all right. Um. Anyway, but the uh, like I said, this like I said, this group probably includes them. But it likely doesn't include another group called the fan rays. And depending on what source you look at, it sometimes includes the, the fan rays. But um, some evidence that I'm going to talk about later suggests that they're actually, that these fan rays, and like I said, if you if you would like to look up pictures, all these are, especially the pan rays and the fan rays are just, they, they look very stingray-y. They're much flatter than some of the other members of these groups. But some of these groups are very hard to place. Because, spoilers, they are weird for the same reasons that we don't really know where turtles go on the reptile family tree. When the early fossil record of a group is not good and the group is really weird, it's hard to figure out exactly where you go. Yeah. So the last group, which those fan rays probably belong in, is called the Torpediniforms. Ooh much more commonly called the electric rays. Which is why I was like, did you know that that was like what kind of ray that was at the beginning? <laughs> Cause some of these can be real dangerous. <laughs> oh geez. Um, yeah. Fun, fun fact uh, before we get into the electric stuff, the military weapon, the torpedo gets its name from a genus of electric ray. So please tell me more about how these can harm you. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> they're, they're called electric rays for a reason. They have two large electricity producing organs, uh, one on sort of each side of their body. And depending on the species, they can produce anywhere from 8 volts up to 220 volts. Oh my God. Which for reference, uh, here in the United States, the voltage that is output from your outlets in your home, your electrical outlets is 120 volts. Most of the rest of the world, it is about 220 volts. So about what this outputs. However, electricity is very complicated. Sometimes, you know, for example, what's really lethal about electricity is the amperage, not necessarily the voltage, but we don't have time to get into that right now. Needless <laughs> to say, um, some of these so are extremely dangerous. They can kill you. I don't know of a reported human death from okay. an electric ray, um, but they certainly use it to, some of them use it to kill their food. Wow. Uh, some of them also only use it mainly for uh, defense. That, that is something that's very common in um, both, both rays and sharks is being able to like sense electricity. Mm -hmm. They have specialized organs around the face that can sense like the natural electricity that all 
animals just kind of give off by existing. Um, which is which is why rays, uh, especially like the, the stingrays, are very you know bottom dwelling adapted because they mostly eat things that live in the the sand and the sediment, and they use their electrical sense to find them. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the the best way to figure out if this is if if you see say you're snorkeling, and you find a a stingray like thing out on the, the reef or the ocean or wherever you are, how to know if it is a, an electric ray is that they're, they're not quite as flat as say a traditional stingray. Um, they look almost like bloated a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they do kind of look bloated. <laughs> and uh, their tail is especially the, the giveaway. It is much fleshier and actually has some, some fins on it on like a stingray tail, which might have one toward the end, but for the most part, don't. So that is the best way. But as always, if you're out interacting with wildlife, maybe don't approach a thing unless you know for sure what it is. Um, um, fun fact. When uh, I go out and do field work on the oyster reefs, there um, are stingrays like locally in the area, wherever. And uh, to... Yeah safely walk in the presence of potential stingrays we do something called the stingray shuffle oh, and yeah. <laughs> it's just where we scuff our feet like as we're walking kind of dragging oh, along mm-hmm. but we like to call it the stingray shuffle for fun i like that me too <laughs> um but yeah so there's, there's a couple of families in the electric rays and uh i also like these because they make them sound way cooler or potentially deadly than they are. The first group I think actually makes sense. They're called the numb fishes. <laughs> As in it'll shock you and make your hand numb or something. Um, yeah. And within that group, there's also a group called the sleeper rays. There's <laughs> the coffin rays. Oh my God. That's brutal. <laughs> which I don't actually think like for the most part, when I saw, um, the ones that really put out high voltages, uh, they're in the, the actual genus Torpedo, mm-hmm. which which is not in the Coffin Rays. So I think that might just be a fun name. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and then lastly, we have the actual group of Torpedo Rays and their relatives. And so you'll notice, like I, like I said, when I started talking about these electric rays, I mentioned the Fan Rays. And I didn't just mention them in that little list of groups in the electric rays. And that's because, like I said, we don't really know where they go. Which is a fun way to transition to their fossil history. Because we don't know a ton about them. And we, we have a lot of fossils of batoids. This, this larger group of all of these groups. The true rays, the skates the um, sawfish and, and guitar fish and relatives, and the electric rays. We have lots of them that we can say are batoids. However, they don't really tell us a lot about their relationships between each of the groups. And Fia, why, why do you think that might be? Um, I would like to have more of an elaboration of Sure. They don't tell us a lot about their relationships. Do you mean like their physical form doesn't tell you how they relate to each other or how they relate within the entire uh, fossil record? To each other. Hmm. Well, because they don't have bones? That's a big part of it. That's mostly what I was getting at. So with, when okay. the skeleton is made out of cartilage, you don't tend to leave fossils. Right. <laughs> the, Like I said, we have lots and lots of batoid fossils. The vast majority of them are isolated teeth. Oh. And that's, and that's not uncommon. You know, sharks are exactly the same. We have tons of shark teeth. And because we decently understand how sharks are related because they are much more distinct, um, or at least 
I'd say le- they're less derived, which is to say different from their ancestors, um, than, you know, things like stingrays are. Being a stingray is a very strange shape. Um, and also, sharks are very, very famous for having thousands and thousands of teeth throughout their lifetime. Yeah. And and rays, to a lesser extent, but that, that's also true for rays as well. Um, generally, I didn't know that. rays... What's that? Oh, I just didn't know that. Yeah, generally, rays have very different teeth than most sharks. You know, you think of things like a great white tooth or like a megalodon tooth, which is, you know, big triangular serrated, or um, if they tend to eat more fish, they'll be more pointy. Um, But most rays, because they hang out on the bottom, are mostly, uh, they're called durophagus, meaning that they eat hard-shelled things. Um, And pointy teeth don't really help you if you're trying to chew through a nice meaty bivalve or gastropod or something. So um, what a lot of rays have for teeth instead of having nice rows, sort of like you have a single row of teeth on each part of your jaw. Um, and sharks have multiple rows at the same time. Instead, what rays have mostly have is plates. So they do mm-hmm. have individual teeth, but they're arranged in crushing plates that just sort of smash into each other and crack up the, the shelly bits. So, wow. and, and they basically look like little pebbles. They're very, like, rounded. Um, they get worn very quickly because they're eating really hard food. And so because they get worn easily, they are replaced often. So they are not particularly distinctive of one group or another. We have um, evidence of teeth that look like they're from batoids, although that's not particularly you know, well supported because there are lots of sharks that also have teeth like that. Hmm. For example, uh, the modern day uh, nurse shark, very common sharks, pretty big sharks, especially like around the Caribbean. Um, I, I got to swim with some when I did some my, my field work in Belize. Um, they can get like 10 feet long or so. So they're, they're pretty big. Um, but they're more or less harmless to people unless you stick your hand in its mouth because they don't have sharp pointy teeth. They have these pebble like crushing teeth. Um, and that's even like a modern example. There's a handful of fossil shark examples that are like true shark sharks, um, that have these crushing teeth too. So it's hard to tell that the first teeth that were like this were from batoids and not some other kind of shark relative, but the first things that we think are from this group are from around 180 million years ago. So at the very beginning of the Jurassic period. Wow. Yeah. And so, uh, fortunately, at least, you know, grand scheme of, of, you know, earth's history, we get a a first articulated. So with most of the skeleton there, batoid from only 30 million years later, 150 million years ago in the, uh, late ish Jurassic. So you would think, oh, that seems pretty early. You know, they, they split off from sharks, I said, roughly 200 million years ago. Mm-hmm. But that articulated one, that first one that we have, is more or less already a guitar fish. Wow. Looks more or less like, you know, obviously different enough to give its own, you know, its own species and has its own unique features. But more or less like our modern guitar fish. So not particularly helpful of how they got to be kind of flat like that. Right. The first true rays, the myliobatiforms, first show up around the late Cretaceous, early Paleogene, give or take 60 million years ago or so, and continue to diversify from there. Um, Because they're so strange, rays have been the subject of a lot of genetic studies, particularly in the last 10 years or so. And a big reason for that is, like I said, because fossils aren't particularly helpful. So the modern things are kind of all we have to work with. You know, in the case of things like sharks, um, they're, they're few and far between, but we do have some really good, fairly transitional fossils of sharks. Plus their teeth are much more different from each other. So that can help out a lot too. 
Um, but with rays, we don't have that luxury of the fossil record being helpful. So are there any fossils that are not teeth? Like it's like its whole body is, is there any possible way that that could, the cartilage part could fossilize? Oh yeah. Um, like I said, that, that one that was more or less a guitar fish, that was yeah. a, a near whole body, nearly whole body. Um, we have some from some freshwater environments from around 50 million years ago in Wyoming. Cool. Yeah. Um, so like we, we, there definitely are fossils, but there are no good transitional fossils is the kicker. Ah, uh, I see. By the time we get the fossils or by the time the thing was fossilized, um, it was already more or less a member of a modern group that we have today. Okay. So because the fossils aren't helpful, we have to look at what we have today. And that's where some of the genetic stuff comes in. And I also think this is a particular example of why genetics isn't always the answer. <laughs> and again, I'm a little biased because in paleontology, typically all you have to work with is the bones and the morphology. So the actual structures and shapes instead of the, the, the DNA. Um, so I'm a little bit biased, but DNA can be useful sometimes. <laughs> Almost all of the phylogenies, so the different trees of, you know, how these different groups are related, b based on morphology, so the actual anatomy of the animals, will put the groups more or less in the order that I listed before. The true stingrays and the skates, closely related together. Just outside of them are the guitar fishes and their relatives. And then outside of that, the first group that split off were the electric rays. So in that order of relatedness. Which, if you... And this, this part's going to get a little technical. So please, feel. let me know if there's something you want to explain further. Um, All right. So if they are related to each other in that order, because the guitar fishes and the electric rays are more shark-like, that would imply that the original... Batoids, the first group to split off of sharks, were more shark-like. And then guitarfish kept that shark-like body while flattening out the front a little, while one group that became the raisin skates became flat and pancakey. And uh, the, the electric rays flattened out a little bit, meaning that the flattening kind of happened twice, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. That's interesting. Right. So that that's what the anatomy says. The DNA does not agree. How so? Based on, and most of this comes from uh, a very complete uh, PhD thesis that somebody did um, that did several studies of you know, regular DNA analysis, mitochondrial DNA analysis, um, and, and various different things. So the, the molecular trees from based on the genetics put the skates as branching off first. Hmm. Then the electric rays are actually somewhere inside the guitar fishes group. And then guitar fishes being the most closely related to the stingrays. That would mean that the original batoids were already flat and that the guitar fishes went back to being more shark-like hmm. instead of keeping the shark-like body. I can see how this would cause some controversy. Right. And so particularly with how they move, not just their shape, but you know, your, your shape sort of dictates a lot of things about how you, uh, function in your environment and particularly because rays and skates move in the same way they don't use their tails they undulate you know sort of move in like a wave-like pattern their pectoral fins which is what makes up most of the the disc that is sort of their front half um so if both of those groups evolved flatness independently then 
they would have had to develop that exact same pattern of moving independently as well. Wow. Yeah. So as to what the actual truth is, I don't know. There are lots of people with very strong opinions about it, I'm sure. Um, Maybe we'll get an answer one day. Maybe we won't. Listeners, if you have strong opinions, please let us know. Absolutely. And so that is Rays and Skates and the weirdos that they're related to. I really was just happy to learn that there are things called guitar fishes and then also banjo rays. Yes. That was very fun to me. I I had never heard of those. Yeah. Um, I was happy that you referred to most uh, stingrays as pancakey. That has definitely got me craving some pancakes. (laughs) Oh, and it's funny. Some of them, so most of uh, rays are also uh, decently colorful a lot of like the true stingrays but the skates tend to be a little more drab colored but there are lots Mm. of stingrays that um are very pancakey but are kind of modeled in their pattern so it looks like the top of a pancake almost yeah that's cool Mm -hmm. (laughs) so that's all i've got but fia you mentioned earlier that swamp corner is actually something about pan rays It's not. (laughs) Sorry to make that misleading. Uh, It was just the pan part that uh, Uh, is slightly related to this. (laughs) Okay. But today, uh, (laughs) sorry to disappoint you, Kevin. No, that's okay. (laughs) Um, Today on Swamp Corner, I wanted to let you guys know about the skillet fish. Gobisox stramosis is the scientific name. What an excellent genus. Yes, it's. I just imagine, (laughs) like a goby, like you, like you've talked about before on Swamp Corner, with just some little socks. (laughs) Unfortunately, they are not even gobies. They're uh, a type of uh, clingfish, which um, is like. uh, It's not very misleading, but yeah, it's taxonomy, man. You know. See, I bet the person who named it was like, oh, this is definitely related to gobies. And then, right. of, of course, it turned out to not be. And because fish, it's probably not even close. Yeah. I mean, I I think that they're, uh, like, close in their uh, history of evolving at some point. Okay. But uh, they are not uh, true gobies is what I should say. Gotcha. Anyways, they are named uh, after their... Uh, dorsal or like top down profile which resembles uh, a skillet or a frying pan which is where I was thinking of the pan Mm -hmm. (laughs) ray so they kind of look like a a pan and they live in marine brackish uh, areas highly associated with reefs um, because they have uh, these pelvic fins or like their uh, bottom fins that form a thoracic sucking disc, which is essentially a really uh, awesome suction cup that they use to cling to shells and rocks and uh, help them hide um, in reefs from uh, predators. Um, They Mm -hmm. mostly feed on like worms and small crustaceans like amphipods and isopods. and they are just super cute. I find them all the time in my samples. <laughs> uh, actually inspiring where I, why I wanted to talk about them. Um, yesterday, I had found a really big one. And um, I'm picking them out and I put them into Petri dishes so that way I can identify them under a microscope. And uh, I, they actually like to, even though they're dead, still uh, cling to the petri dishes <laughs> so I'm trying to like pick this one up and it's clinging and there's like a bunch of other fish still on the petri dish and it I'm like trying to get it off and it still is able to like hold the petri dish and the, the other fish and, on and it. They're, so, after they're dead after they're dead yeah um wow. it's it's really essentially like a suction cup because 
it's not, um, they're not using any like forces from their uh, like living uh, self, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's really just like how like a suction cup would work. You just like push and once the air is lost, it creates this like vacuum yeah. um, underneath them. So yeah, uh, skillet fish are really cool and their suction cup is quite strong. And that's, that's pretty neat. For you. <laughs> no, I like that. Um, cause I know, uh, another type of fish that has like a suction cup type thing are, uh, remoras, which are very commonly seen on big fish like whales or, uh, very famously, if you play Pokemon like I do, um, <laughs> on manta rays, but they yeah. have a suction cup like on the top of their head. Oh. And I no. don't know how they do that. Yeah. And that's kind of where I thought you were going with this. I thought it would be something related, but no, they actually just sort of suction cup their pectoral fin. So they're effectively their quote unquote arms. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Fish are so weird, man. They are. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for that wonderful swamp corner for us today, Fia. And thank you all listeners for listening and, and giving us any of your attention there's so much out there on the internet so that anybody would listen to us talk about fish for an hour which is just blows my mind um so thank you all for watching watching listening and uh, <laughs> we will we will see you all next week it is it is late and i need to go to bed <laughs> this episode of i wish you were dead was written by gavin davidson and hosted by gavin davidson mike bryson and finella campanino it was sound edited and edited for YouTube by Gavin Davidson. Special thanks to former guests of the pod and to listeners like you.